Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. This is part E of lecture 4 on descriptive st statistics and Islamic approach. In the last lecture, we saw that inflation rates vary by household according to the composition of commodities that they purchase within their budget. So in this lecture, we consider whether we can look at all of these inflation rates together instead of trying to reduce them to one number called the inflation rate. The mindset of statistics uh, standard statistics, conventional statistics due to Sir Fisher is the reduction of data. You take a large data set, but we can't handle large data sets. We have fear of big data, so we try to reduce it to one number. The modern mindset, because we do have uh, big computers now and they can look at a large number of uh, data points, is that we should look at big data sets. So there is really the, an opposition between the ancient mindset of statistics and the modern mindset. Now, in context of inflation, we have seen that each uh, bundle of commodities leads to a separate inflation rate. Every household purchases a different bundle. So actually, there are millions of inflation rates. Every household has its, has its own inflation rate. So the question is, can we reduce all of this data into one number? The answer is no, we cannot reduce all of this data to one number without serious loss of information. So it's not uh, a useful idea to think of one inflation rate for the whole population. The conventional method looks for sufficient statistics. This uh, makes a theoretical assumptions about the uh, distribution of the data. And then if the data actually has this uh, theoretical distribution, then one number can be used to capture the theoretical distribution. So this can be done if, for example, all of the data is numer normally distributed. But these assumptions are typically false. Uh, they can fail by a little bit, in which case the methodology fails only a little bit, or they can fail by a lot. Uh, and especially in big data sets, we, have, we see a lot of deviations from. Uh, theoretical ideal distributions. It has now become possible to analyze directly big data sets without trying to reduce them, without uh, making arbitrary theoretical assumptions about them. And so this requires a new way of thinking, new mindsets, new tools and new techniques. And that's uh, those are in process of being developed for analyzing big data. So in this lecture, we're going to try to look at how we might analyze inflation if we had measure for each household separately. Uh, in general, uh, there are surveys made of household income and expenditure. And in the 2006 survey for which data is available in Pakistan, there were 39,677 households in the sample. This is a small sample because we are looking at um, 210 million population. If the sample is chosen properly <coughs> as a representative, then it becomes possible to use this sample of 40,000 households to analyze the whole population. But um, the data requirements for the analyzing this are large. If you have to look at consumption bundles for each household, that's 200 million households, that's, that's a lot of data. Uh, 40,000 is still quite large. Um, the data requirement for prices is much smaller because most households see the same prices and then the prices are the same uh, for a large, larger period of time. The, it's usually possible to track consumption expenditures for a few households. We can't do it for 200 million. And so if we can choose this, these households a small number which are representative of the whole population, then we can use this to make inference about the whole population. This is the general um, principle for data analysis in large data sets. We try to find a small data set which is representative of the bigger data set. And this is the, uh, this, one of the means, one of this, one of what it, this means is to have the data distribution match the small data set. The distribution of the small data set should match the distribution of the big data set. Now we will illustrate this by using 
by an artificial example for inflation rates. Here is a hypothetical methodology for measuring inflation. Measure it separately for each household. This is currently not possible, but it is close to becoming possible in um, economies like China and USA. They have fairly good tracking of everything every person is doing, so they can even actually find out the entire consumption bundle, every purchase that one individual made in 2001-18. So if we had the entire consumption for 2018 and also the entire consumption for 2019, then we could compute the last pair and PASH index for inflation for each household separately. And PASH index being the current consumption is the uh, best uh, possibility. We could calculate that. Currently, it is not possible. We don't have that information in Pakistan and even in advanced countries, the information is currently not collected, although it could be done. If we switch from PASH to last pair, we would reduce the data requirement because we could, because we, use, we could use the consumption bundles for one year and just keep them fixed, assuming that the changes are small. Um, if we take a random sample, this is something we'll discuss later, then maybe we could just sample a 40,000 households instead of 200 million. That would certainly substantially reduce the uh, data requirement. Also, we can partition the population into homogeneous clusters. We could take a large group of people which are similar in some ways and then take one person to represent each cluster. This is another way to reduce the data requirement. Uh, we will generate artificial data sets to calculate uh, inflation for each household and show how this process works. And the goal of this exercise is to understand what inflation numbers mean in a, in a deeper way. Here we look at a data set for only 10 households to get an idea of what we are trying to do. Here I have generated random numbers. First, we have, we use the, we have these eight commodities, wheat, rice, chicken, milk, oil, pulses, potatoes, and sugar. And we have the inflation rate for each of these commodities. And this is actual data uh, from 2008. So there was 8.8% .8 inflation in wheat prices, 18% in rice prices, negative 3% in oil, and negative 8% in sugar, 24% in pulses. So now, depending on what combination of goods each household purchases, they will experience different rates of inflation overall. So we look at household one, each purchased 47 units of wheat, 82 units of rice, five units of chicken only, uh, 30 units of meal, 66 units of oil, 10 units of pulse, 93 of potatoes, and 53 of sugar. So if we use these numbers as weights for the uh, inflation, we can just multiply these two together, uh, multiply the weights by the inflation rates and divide by the sum of all the numbers. That gives us 9.27%. 9 9 that is the inflation rate that was experienced by household one. Now household two made different purchases and so they got a rate of 9.5. Household three saw 8.08%. Household four uh, purchased a lot of milk. You can see 94 units of milk and milk has the highest inflation rate. So it got, it saw 10.7% uh, inflation. If you look at household six, this is the one with the highest inflation, 11.68%. Why? Because it purchased 45 units of pulses and 36 units of milk. And these are the two commodities with the highest amount of inflation. So basically, depending on which commodity you purchased, uh, you see different rates of inflation. So these numbers have an average, but that average doesn't really describe any household. A uh, better way to look at this data set would be to say that these 10 households experienced inflation ranging between 8.08%, which is the minimum, to 12.81%, which is the maximum. Uh, according to the consumption patterns. If we have very large samples, then we cannot look at each number separately like we were doing for the 10 households. Suppose, for example, we have 200 households and we 
generate 200 inflation numbers. Then in order to look at the data, we have to make a histogram. And this is a histogram made on this picture on the right hand side. Um, this histogram uh, gives us inflation from 4.05% to 5.3%. And then the, in the first category, and there are about three or four households in this category, and then there is 5.3 to 6.6, .6, which is the next category. And this has uh, um, maybe five households. So for each range inflation, uh, the histogram tells us how many households experience inflation in that range. Uh, the, reason, the point of making such a picture is that our minds are not built to process 200 numbers. These, this is for good job for computers, but not for our minds. So basically, statistics are aids to translate the data into a format which, can under, which our minds can understand. Uh, so which format should it be? Well, uh, that depends very much on the purpose of the data analysis. Why we want to look at the data will determine the format that we want to use to represent the data. We can look at the histogram data by uh, looking at this picture, which uh, looking at this table, which tells us that in the bin between 5.2 to 6.4 percent, there are six households. From 6.4 to 7.6, there are 15 households, and so on. So each category is um, uh, the number of households in that category is counted. So in this, uh, the largest number is households are um, the belong to the category between 8.8 .8 and 10.0 um, and then um, the middle range uh, has um, six point going from 7.6 percent to 10.0 uh, to 11.2 to, to has about 123 households. So uh, this tells us something about how many households experienced what level of inflation. Now the original data set has 200 households and if we want to reduce the data we can cluster five households into one and reduce the data from 200 to 40 uh, that is the numbers in the last column. So we take five households belonging to the lowest one and represent it by one household. And then we will have three households in the next range from 6.4 to 7.6. These three households represent 15 households and so on. So this is one way to do data reduction. With this kind of numbers, these 40 households will have roughly the same distribution as the original 200. So this, in this way, the 40 households can be used as a reduced data set for analyzing the distribution of inflation in the full population. So this is one of the ways to do data reduction. The classical method of data re reduction relies on uh, representation. Uh, the mean is supposed to be representative of the data. If we take the average of all of the 200 inflation numbers, we find that it is 10.0%. So what does this 10.0 tell us? Does this represent the experience of many households? Well, no, it doesn't. The, the inflation experienced by households varies a lot from 5% um, to 14%. Does it provide a benchmark for high and low inf inflation? Again, this answer is no. Uh, so what is the relation of the mean or the average to the data? Well, you take all the 200 numbers, add them up and divide by 200. So that's a technical formula, but what does it mean? Uh, the meaning comes from a theoretical assumption. If the data are actually normal, then uh, this number is the best estimate for the mean of the underlying normal distribution. What this means is actually the main topic of 
a large amount of statistical theory. But all of this theory is meaningful only if the fundamental assumption that the data actually follows a normal distribution is true. And this assumption may or may not be valid. So we look for better ways to understand the data directly without making assumptions. And so if you want to represent the data, the mode is a better representation. This is the largest bin. And in our previous graph, it goes from 8.8% to 10%. So what we can say is that the largest number of families, that is 55 families out of 200, saw inflation within this range. Uh, this is a somewhat misleading statement because even though we're talking about the largest numbers, it is not um, it is not a big number. 55 could be a small number. Uh, so whenever you say uh, the largest number, you should always ask compared to what? So here what we are comparing with is the number of families in other bins, even though it is not mentioned. And so somebody who doesn't know what we are comparing it to would find it misleading, would misunderstand the statement. As opposed to this, if we say that um, if we look at the middle three bins, there are 123 families in it. So if we say that the largest number of family, 123 families, saw inflation between the range 7.6 to 11.2 percent, this is a, a description of the data which is accurate. And so this, these numbers could be taken as representative. So if we could say that most uh, families experience inflation between 7.6 and 11.2%, so this range of numbers provides a representation of the general experience of the population. Obviously, this cannot be done with one number. Another number which is uh, closely related to the actual data and has meaning in terms of the actual data is the median. The median inflation in this data set is 9.9%. What does this mean? It means that half of the households had inflation rates below of this number and the other half had in, uh, inflation rates above this name, number. So in this case, 9.9% is a benchmark. It's a standard for comparison. If a household has infl sees experience above this benchmark, then it has seen high inflation. If uh, below this inflation is low inflation. How do we compute the median? Uh, the first step is to sort the data from the smallest to the largest, from 1 to 200. Then the middle uh, point is the inflation. Now, if you have odd data, like if you have 401 points, then the middle point will be the 201th point. With even data set, both 200 and 201 are in the middle, and so everything that falls between these two is counted as a median. So in the, the hundredth point, uh, we see 9.93 percent inflation. At the hundred and first point, uh, the hundred and uh, one zero one household had 9.94 percent inflation. And so um, the inflation, the median inflation is between these two numbers. So there is a technical def definition of median. Uh, which we will uh, discuss in detail later on. So in conclusion, we can say that the nature inflation of inflation is such that it is variable across households and it cannot be captured by one number. If we just use one number, which is the common, then this leads to loss of credibility. People say, yeah, the government is telling us that there's 7% inflation, but um, price of my food has doubled. So they are lying. And um, the um, so in order to overcome this, one has to do both things. One has to educate the public about what inflation means. It's not one commodity, but it's all of the commodities, all of the food basket that we are measuring. And so uh, one uh, exceptional uh, price will not uh, make a big difference. Uh, but the other part is that there is no one inflation uh, number which captures the whole experience. So we have to give use a range of uh, numbers. So when we talk about representative experience, it is better to use the modal value uh, which uh, collects uh, families into groups. But we should use big groups, big bins instead of small bins. If you have small bins, that leads to misleading modes because uh, like we saw, the um, 
8.2 to 10 percent bin contains the largest number of families, uh, 55, but 55 is still a small compared to the whole population. So if we use a bigger bin going from uh, 7 percent to 11 percent, then we get about half of the population in this. Another way to capture the a range of experience is called the interquartile range. This is the middle half of the data. So if we go from the, in a, in a list of uh, 200 numbers, if we go from the 50th number to a 150th number, we will get the middle half of the data. And in this data set, this comes from 8.66% to 11.41%. So we can say this is called the interquartile range. And uh, so we can say that this set, 8.66% to 11.4%, represents the experience of half of the population, with 25% of the population being below 8.66 and 25% of the population being above 11.41. So this, this is a much better way to describe the experience of most of the households. The mean and the standard deviation, which are normally used for this purpose, are valid if the data is actually normally distributed, but pretty useless otherwise. If the data is far from normal, then the mean and standard deviation can be very misleading numbers.